Hi guys, so everyone's favorite grifter, Nigel Farage, was interviewed by Sky News. Now, Nigel Farage is a slippery individual because he wants to stay on both sides of the argument. Because, let, let me explain. So, in, the, in regards to this Brexit deal, he can't criticize it too much. Because if he criticizes it too much, he puts himself into a small niche of people who will continue to criticize the, the deal after it has been done. And that world is getting smaller and smaller because even members of the ERG are warming to this deal. Now, he doesn't also want to jump on board with the deal because he knows that if he does that, then he can't criticize it later on. If we turn the clock back a little bit, you remember during the withdrawal agreement, at the beginning with the withdrawal agreement, he was criticizing it, criticizing it, criticizing it. Then as we got closer to the withdrawal agreement before it was signed, then he sort of jumped on board and said, I'll support Boris Johnson in getting this, uh, getting this through Parliament if necessary before the election. He said, uh, I'll support Boris Johnson. It's, pretty, it's a good deal, but there are some issues with it. Now, that wasn't him being honest. That was him trying to play both sides. Because you have to remember, Nigel Farage needs attention. That's his oxygen. He needs attention constantly. And he knows that if he jumps on the wrong side he's going to lose that attention. If he jumps on board with Boris Johnson, he will become irrelevant. But on the, on the other hand, he doesn't want to be just on the sidelines criticizing the deal because he will become irrelevant also on that, on that side. So he has, to, he has to steer the boat somewhere in between. And it's not because he's genuinely critical of it, it's because he cares about his own position. So let's move on to what he had to say. Raj joins me now. Very good to talk to you and uh, a happy Christmas to you. Is this the, the kind of Christmas present you wanted from the Prime Minister? I'm guessing from what I said there, it's not. Oh, look, I'm saying it's not perfect and I'm worried that we're going to be too closely aligned to EU rules. And indeed, you know, that's what the EU bosses are saying, um, that we will not be able to step out of line uh, without them having the threat of imposing immediate tariffs. But, but notice how he forgets to mention it goes both ways. Boris Johnson did the same thing. So it's all, you know, if we if we step up, we didn't want them to punish us if we step out of line because they would impose tariffs on us. Yes, and the other way, it can work the other way too. If the EU step out of line, if the EU don't increase standards and you do, then the EU can be punished. You notice how the Brexiteers ignore this fact. Look, that detail We'll discover in the next... Sorry, and this is something that would apply to other trade deals, not just with the EU. If the UK do a trade deal with Australia, for example, going forward, I imagine a part of that would be if Australia breaks some rule, the UK can take them to an arbitrary body, an ar a body of arbitration and punish them. In the same way is if the UK breaks some rule that was in the trade agreement, and Australia have a problem with it, they can take the UK to this arbitrary arbitration body, sorry, and punish them in some way. Why is it different with when it's become when it comes to the EU? Why is it the EU are not allowed to do these things? A couple of days. All right. What I did think was good news was when Barnier said that the British had made no commitments on foreign policy or defense. That sounded like really quite good progress. How is that progress? Also, Nigel is ignoring that there, there are going to be further agreements. This only covers trade. There are other agreements that will have to be made in the future. As I said before, Nigel Farage and the Brexiteers seem to think that Nigel Farage doesn't believe it because he, he, he pretends not to believe it um, or not to understand it. But he knows deep down it's, it's certainly the case. Going forward, the UK's relationship with the EU is going to change, yes, but it's not going to end. There will always be a relationship. There will be cooperation on many issues. As the world changes, as globalization impacts the, the world in a continuous way, the UK and the EU are going to have to cooperate on things. That's normal. And if we take the big picture, you know, and, and don't forget, I've been campaigning for us to leave for 30 years. Uh, I wouldn't call it campaigning. <laughs> I would call it lying and pouring poison into the minds of, of voters. Yes, you've been doing that for 30 years. 
And this is, may not be perfect, but it's a very, very big day and a big step forward. So look, overall, of course, of course, I've got concern. See, of course, he's got concern because he doesn't want to jump on one side of the of this divide. He doesn't want to say I'm fully on board with Boris Johnson because then he would become irrelevant. And he doesn't want to jump on the other side and say this deal is terrible. We need to stop it. We need to close it down because he knows that the voters and the general public wouldn't be on board with him. This is not 2016. The country has moved on. He knows that that type of language doesn't work anymore. Over areas, but is this progress? Are we far better off than we were five years ago? Absolutely. If you were an MP, would you vote for it? Uh, well, I'd need to see the detail, and I would not want to be bounced into voting for it in a couple of days having not read it. So I think what Parliament should do is have a vote in principle, and then in the new year, go through it in detail. In principle, Given where we are right now, given that this has been the most divisive issue in British politics for three... Wow. <laughs> you know, he always mixes in some of the some truth with the lies. Yes, it has been a very divisive issue. And why has it been a very divisive issue is because of this guy on the screen. Decades. If this brings some peace and some stability, then yes, in principle, I would. Mike, the, the, the guy who has started the fire... The arsonist is now welcoming the fire brigade, now welcoming uh, the, the, extinguishing, the extinguishing of the fire. OK, uh, but what do you think? I want to ask you about the, the Prime Minister's language there, about the continuing connections with the European Union. Uh, when he talks, I mean, obviously he's used this language an awful lot, our EU partners and friends, we know that, but about being culturally, emotionally, historically and strategically <laughs> attached to yeah. Europe. And that uh, we remain uh, collaborative with uh, the EU over issues like science. And he also said our basic goals remain the same. Yeah, I just shook my head. I don't, I don't agree at all. I think we actually have a much closer cultural affinity with many parts of the English-speaking world. <laughs> the guy who has, what is it, his children or his partner has a German passport? Like, once again, stop listening to Nigel Farage because he's a liar. He's a charlatan. Stop listening to him. I have to do this because I need to call him out. Because nobody else seems to be willing to call him out. Nigel Farage is a charlatan. He's been lying to people for years. He's been pouring poison into people's ears. Now, why is Nigel Farage saying, well, you know, we're, we're more culturally connected with Canada or Australia than we are with the French or the Germans or the Italians? <laughs> Walk down any street and you'll find a pizzeria. You'll find a wine bar. You'll find... Um, you go into any supermarket and you'll find French cheese, you'll, fry, you'll find um, Italian food, Indian food, like, and I'm not talking about just like, not restricting it to the EU, of course, to Europe. You'll find food from all over the world in your local supermarket. You are impacted by your neighbours. That's normal. Every country is impacted culturally, socially, economically, financially, by politically even by their neighbors you can't get away from like i know nigel farage doesn't believe this this is the worst part about all of this nigel farage doesn't believe the words he's saying he knows that some people do and these people their ears prick up when he says these things this is the worst thing about nigel farage because i believe if you sat down with nigel farage and had a meal with him he'd probably eat pasta or a pizza or he'd have a german beer on the on the in the fridge because he doesn't believe the crap that he's saying he knows other people do and he sells it to them and he's done very well for himself you know you have to commend him in a way he's able to sell people lies and they lap it up he knows and this is, and I've talked about this before, he knows that talking about Canada, Australia, New Zealand, 
links in with a certain psyche that exists within the British public, not the entire British public, a certain faction of the British public. Let, let's be honest here, racists, okay? These people don't like the French because they speak another language. They don't like the Germans because of what happened during the war. They don't like the Italians because maybe they're a bit too tanned. Some of them are a bit too tanned. They don't like uh, people from Eastern Europe because, well, they're, you know, they're better at doing, you know, plumbing and stuff like that than we are. They work very hard and some of us don't want to work hard. And I'm not blaming just the British here. I'm talking about in many countries, there is this mentality. And Nigel Farage knows that these people exist and he knows how to speak to these people. And these people turn around and they vote for him in uh, European elections or they donate money to the, his party or they come out and protest because he tells them to. Than we do with continental Europe. And, and, and that's one of the reasons, of course, in the end that we voted for Brexit. Um, you know, Boris does his PC bit. Um, plays up the pro-European side of things. He, of course, himself, until the referendum came along, had always been a supporter of the European project. But look, uh, the truth of it is... Because Boris Johnson is another charlatan like Nigel Farage. I don't honestly know what Boris Johnson thinks about the European Union. If you were to, if you were to get me to answer the question, if I had to answer it, I would say he's not pro-European, but he likes the idea of Europe. He, I think if somebody had come to Boris Johnson maybe 10 years ago and said, Boris, if the UK stays in the European Union, there's a possibility that you could become the president of the European Commission. Would you like that job? And he would say, yes, I would. Because he likes the prestige. He liked, That's why he became prime minister. That was his amb ambition. He likes the prestige. He doesn't have any, any real ideology. I don't think Boris Johnson has any ideology, apart from making himself uh, look good, improving his own position, his own narcissism, perhaps. But he doesn't really have any pro-European or anti-European ideology. He knows, like Nigel Farage, that the, there are certain people in the country that are easily turned on, easily made angry about certain things. And if you push the right buttons, these people will explode. Whatever he said there, and I, you know, I'd also question what he said about the fact we've got, that we've got a Canada star deal. We haven't. Um, you, know, you have to take what Boris says with a pinch of salt. I think the truth of it is that the European Union itself is divided from north to south by a currency that doesn't work for the south at all. Now, once again, Nigel Farage knows that's untrue. The problem is not the currency. The problem is how the currency is used, how not actually the currency itself. It's not even how the currency is used. It's the economic models that exist in different countries. That's the problem, because if it, if the problem was the currency, then why would there be economic? Why are there not economic problems in the Netherlands or in Denmark? Sorry, not in Denmark, but in um, in uh, Germany or Austria? Why? Why are there not the same issues as there are in perhaps Greece or Italy or in Spain? It's a cultural difference. It's an economic model that's different. It's not the currency. I know it's very easy to point your finger at the currency and say it's the currency is the problem. It's not the currency. The problem is much deeper than that. Divide the East to West culturally. Are we seeing you know, the EU budget being vetoed and countries like Poland and Hungary very unhappy? And I think in the broader picture, Brexit is the beginning of the end of the European Union. I'm pro-European. I'm pro european <laughs> Don't say, once again, he's, this lie, once again, he pushes out the lie. I'm pro-European. I'm against the European Union. But at the same time, he doesn't want cooperation with the French or the Germans or the Italians or anyone like that. But it's, I, once again, I see, this is the slippery part about Nigel Farage. It's not that he doesn't want... He knows that certain people don't want. That's what he's focusing on. His opinions are irrelevant because he's, fall, he's injecting opinions. He's putting, the, he's putting opinions forward that he's saying are his. The European Union is going to collapse 
Uh, look, I've been hearing stories about how the European was, Union was going to collapse since the frigging 1990s. Okay. Nigel Farage has been talking about the European Union about to collapse for 30 years. Yes, it's about to collapse at any moment now. Like we've been hearing this story. Are there problems? Yes, there are. Ironically, Brexit has, in a sense, strengthened unity within the European Union, not weakened it. Brexiteers were saying, as soon as we vote to leave, the European Union will collapse. As soon as we leave, uh, there will be a, a, a whole queue of countries lining up to leave the European Union model of the European Union project right behind us. That didn't happen. It actually went the opposite way. I'll give you an example of that. Here in Italy, there is the League Party, a xenophobic right-wing headbanger party, <laughs> um, which is very friendly with Nigel Farage. They have invited him to speak. Um, he's very friendly with uh, Matteo Salvini, who's the leader of this party. Until the Brexit referendum, the League Party wanted to have a referendum on the euro and they wanted to have a referendum on EU membership. Recently, that has sort of disappeared from their manifesto. It is still talked about, but it's not pushed as it was before. Why is that the case? Is it because people have realised, actually, what's, what's happening to Britain at the moment is not something very positive. Britain is not better off since Brexit. And, you know, we're, we're still waiting for the real impact of Brexit to happen. Nigel Farage wants to pr promote the idea that the European Union is collapsing. He's been doing it for 30 years and some people still believe him. Now, as I said before, there are serious issues. H Hungary and Poland are threatening the European Union, uh, the unity of the European Union. But I think it's short term. There are mechanisms to deal with them. I have my own uh, my own opinions on that, but I don't think it's going to be something that will bring down the European Union. Europe of sovereign states trading and being friends, not being run from Brussels. But why does that matter to you? That uh, I mean, it still seems the project goes on there. You want to see the disintegration of the the European Union, you know, the UK is out, you got what you wanted, let the EU do what the EU's going to do. No, I don't agree. I spent 20 years over there um, and I saw... See, now this is back to Nigel Farage, back to his grift. See, Nigel Farage, if, if Nigel Farage cared about Britain and getting Britain out, and he truly, you know, cared about Brexit, then that would be it. He would move on. See, but this is not what Nigel Farage cares about. Nigel Farage cares about attention. As I said at the beginning, it's, it's his oxygen. He knows that, okay, if this thing is not an absolute disaster, this will help me because I can go to Germany and meet with very particular individuals, <laughs> particular parties, which, look, let me just go off on a side tangent for a moment. Nigel Farage has been invited to speak by basically neo-fascist parties in Germany, while at the same time Nigel Farage is meeting um, veterans from World War II in RAF air, uh, airfields and uh, museums and talking about British bulldog spirit during the Blitz and being invited to speak with neo-fascists in Germany and in Italy as well. So, but let's get back to the main point. But no, let's get back to oh, Nigel. The, the, the undemocratic nature of the way this project is run, the fact that it benefits big multinational businesses and damages all the small men and women trying to do their best. OK, here we have again this Brexit was about ordinary people. It was not about uh, creating a situation where disaster capitalism could come in, uh, where companies had gone to the wall, where people had been laid off and being able to jump in there and take advantage of the situation. No, no, Brexit was not about that. How has Brexit empowered ordinary people? Please, would somebody ask Nigel Farage? I'll try to ask Nigel Farage. Of course, he would never respond to me. I'm not, I'm too small of a, of a, of a fish. Somebody ask him, how does Brexit help ordinary people? The, the ordinary person who's living in a council flat 
maybe on so on um, on universal credit. Them voting for Brexit, how does it help them? Because it's not it's not me saying that Brexit helps ordinary people. It's Nigel Farage has been saying this. The people who voted for the Brexit party voted because they believed Brexit would help them as individuals. It would help the working class. How has it helped the working class? Uh, it doesn't seem to be helping the working class at the moment. Or do we just have to wait for maybe, as, as Jacob Rees-Mogg said, 50 years, and then after 50 years, it will help the working class? Um, and as history teaches us, you know, when Europe is happy and settled, it makes our lives easier too. And all I can see is conflict building up north, south, east and west within, within a European Union uh, that, that, frankly, uh, just wants to build this modern day empire with an absolute... <laughs> the idea of Nigel Farage, a right winger, talking about how the European Union want to create an empire. This is the guy who wants to go back to the British Empire. He wants to to bring Canada, New Zealand, Australia back within the British sphere of influence. Restart Empire 2.0. This is, if you ask certain Brexiteers, that's what they want. You know, before we, before we went into the European Union, everything was great. We had an empire. For some people, they believed that the empire was given up in order to join the European Union. Now, I'm, I don't know what percentage of Brexiteers believe that, but some of them do, which is absolutely absurd because the UK entered because it was economically unviable. It, had to, it was suffering financially and it had to join the European Union. Nigel Farage is back once again because he needs oxygen. He needs attention. He knows that if he criticizes the deal too strongly, he will put himself beyond the pale. If he jumps on board Boris Johnson, he becomes irrelevant. And he's back to his old grift again of the European Union is about to collapse at any moment. Um, it, I'm pro-European, but not I'm pro our anti-EU, while at the same time, he doesn't want anything to do with the French. He doesn't want anything to do with the Germans. But once again, I'm mistaking Nigel Farage for his rhetoric, because I'm pretty sure that Nigel Farage doesn't believe these things, but he, he knows that certain people within the population do, and he speaks to them. Now, I may be wrong. I'd like to know your comments in the comment section. As always, your comments are greatly appreciated. Thanks a lot. I want to say a big, big thank you to all of my patrons. You ensure that this channel continues to exist. I'm eternally grateful for all of your support. If you join Patreon, you will receive instant access to our Discord server, where we have both audio and video chats. You can chat with me and other patrons, where we discuss important and non-important issues. Becoming a patron per month costs about the same as a large coffee. So why not check it out?